Okay, maybe you know the story. Mr. Gibson was driving in the night. He was stopped by a police officer from California who was Jewish. And Mr. Gibson was removed from the car, and uh, perhaps you have read his words that have been on the internet and other places. He uh, held forth a long monologue of uh, anti-Jewish. The Jews are trying to destroy America. The Jews started all the wars. The Jews are a terrible problem. Later he apologized. He said he was just drunk. But the comments revealed that there was uh, that there's still this this deep controversy about acceptance of Jewish people in the United States, uh, and it showed that you that at least occasionally a very influential and popular celebrity could uh, express such views in public. Uh, so as as that is a uh, a stepping off point, uh, let me say a few words about the situation with Jewish people in the United States and some of the prejudice uh, that persists and some of the responses. Uh, and again, if you have questions, please ask them. Uh, I know you're working to understand my English and I, I want to communicate as best as I can. Uh, first of all, uh, the Jewish community in the United States is a very difficult category to define because it cannot be defined by religious practice. Probably 80% of American Jews are not actively practicing the historic Jewish religion. So religious practice doesn't tell us who is a Jew and who might experience prejudice. Language no longer clearly identifies the Jewish person. Uh, there are two languages historically that have been associated in the United States with Jews. One is Yiddish, a <coughs> dialect of German spoken in the Rhineland that many Jewish immigrants brought with them to the United States when they came about 100 years ago. This language is dying out. It is simply being washed away by English. Uh, only uh, older people typically speak it. The other language is Hebrew, which is very much alive in the state of Israel, but once again is only sort of artificially maintained in some Jewish schools in the United States. So what I'm saying is the vast majority 97, 98% of American Jews speak English that is completely identical with the English spoken by other Americans. So language is not uh, an identifier. Physical appearance is also not an identifier. Geography is no longer an identifier. So that as the uh, Jewish community has uh, lived in the United States and has prospered, a very basic question is, who is a Jew and who gets to decide who is a Jew? I don't know whether that's understandable. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? That it's, am I Jewish? And if I am, did you decide it for me? Did the policeman decide it? Did the judge, did the teacher? So it's very different from being black or Puerto Rican, where there are other indicators. Despite this uh, blending in, there are a number of stereotypes that persist uh, in both popular uh, culture and sometimes in more literary culture that could be seen as negative uh, descriptions of Jews. And I will just sort of uh, walk through these one by one. Some of them uh, may be uh, images that are familiar to you here in Serbia. I don't know. But uh, there are a series of stereotypes that persist even if the actual person cannot be readily identified. Stereotype number one, it, it, it's a double face. It's like Janus, the Roman god, with two faces. On the one side, Jew as capitalist money-making, wealthy banker taking money from other people. The flip 
side, if you will, is Jew as communist, Marxist, anti-capitalist troublemaker. Now, it may seem very odd, but you are probably aware that uh, Karl Marx himself uh, was of Jewish ancestry, although he criticized Jews in a number of ways. Uh, and a number of the radical uh, left-wing political figures in American history have also been Jewish, but also many very wealthy bankers have been Jewish. So one stereotype is the double stereotype of the Jew who wants to make a ton of money and the Jew that wants to take your money because he's communist. Strange image. Second one, and I come back to Mel Gibson. Um, the movie that he made, The Passion of the Christ, perhaps some of you have seen it. I, 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 I think it has a number of very positive and significant characteristics as an art form. I uh, didn't think it was uh, anti-Jewish in my viewing of it. But some of the debate that has gone on uh, centers around the portrayal of the Jew historically as a cruel Christ killer. And some of the uh, critiques of Mr. Gibson's movie uh, have tried to make that case. Now, the, the uh, cruel Christ killer image or label of the Jew goes very far back. Uh, for example, uh, of the four Gospels in the New Testament, the Gospel of John constantly talks about Jesus and his ministry in opposition to the Jews. The Jews did this, the Jews did that, and then Jesus did this, and then the Jews did this. If you read the Gospel of John as a separate document with no historical reference, you would never guess that Jesus was a Jew, and that he was in fact a rabbi, and that his followers called him rabbi because he was a rabbi. So there is this uh, the, the Jews who are bad. This negative Jewish image coming from the Bible, it comes back in the Middle Ages, in the production of plays in, around Europe, and then still later, uh, and here um, a translation may be, may be of help, there's something called the Passion Play tradition, which is a play often produced in Germany giving thanks for the fact that the village where the play was produced uh, escaped the plague, and they write a play of a religious nature, and very often the Jews in the play are very unpleasant folks. Does that... Is that, uh, maybe that needs explanation, I don't know. <laughs> This image of the cruel Jew, and, and, and please, these categories that I'm speaking about, they overlap. Some, sometimes more than one category is being presented at the same time. The cruel Jew also appears in Shylock, in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. He's also a greedy Jew, but he is also cruel. He is gratuitously cruel. Do you know the play, Merchant of Venice? And the, the Jew, Shylock, once pound of the man's body in payment. It's gratuitous cruelty, because it will kill him. Yes. So, that's the cruel Jew, and overlapping with that, we now, because Shylock, if, if you see the play the way it's typically produced, Shylock is a very ugly man, has a large nose, he's hunched over, uh, he's unappealing personally. So now we go 
but to the ugly Jew. The physically ugly Jew. Specifically, the physically ugly Jewish man. In Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, uh, which is not a popular book in America, but which reflects certain residual attitudes, Hitler takes the image of the uh, Jew, a Jewish boy or a Jewish man, and makes it as ugly as possible, and then says, this ugly man will seek to get a Christian woman. So the ugliness acquires a sexual implication. Ugly and sexually predatory. Which is beyond Shylock. Shylock just wants money. When Jewish students were first admitted to universities in the 18th century, and we're talking about Jewish males only, the other students were wearing wigs. <laughs> it is my theme song, you know. Okay. Uh, the other male students wear wigs. This is the time of Amadeus, you know. They have a wig, the man. They have the, the, the breeches with the stockings. They have no beard. They are rather uh, sexually ambiguous, you might say. Then in comes the Jewish student. What does the Jewish male student look like? Has a beard. He's got the boots. He's got hair here. He's got secondary sexual characteristics. And next, and, 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 the, and the male Christian student may even have white makeup on. You know. So the contrast is one of secondary sexual characteristics and is perhaps very threatening to the uh, other males. And I think this is a very strong theme. So we have the ugly Jew, and he is ugly uh, in ways that may have some sexual uh, undertones. Next, from ugly, you can sometimes go to funny. The comic Jew. Charles Chaplin. Jerry Seinfeld. Ben Stewart. Yes. Thank you. Voila, yes, and, 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 you know, uh, Groucho Marx. Uh, the, the Jewish person, usually a male, not always, but often a male, who uses maybe his oddness or his, even his ugliness and his lack of power to verbally be entertaining. And, and a stereotype comment might be, well, you're Jewish, how come you're not funny? Just like, well, you're black, how come you can't rap? You know, this is the sort of view that if you have this characteristic, uh, uh, this, this national identity or this ethnic identity, you should be able to do certain things. Uh, and related to this Jewish entertainer image, comedian, is the Jew as complainer, because the entertainment may be a it offered in the way of, to use a Yiddish expression, kvetching, complaining about things. Uh, and uh, uh, Billy Crystal, I don't know if he's well known, but he's another American comedian who his, his joke style is often to complain about something. And Steinfeld does this too. So uh, Jews complaining, but they're really funny in the way they complain. And maybe if they're ugly, no one would say that Groucho Marx was beautiful with the big mustache and less hair than I have, but uh, he's funny. He's very funny. So we've got cruel to ugly to funny, and then we can come back to 
greedy, but not greedy on a high scale, just sort of grabbing, grubbing um, Judas in the Bible. His name coincidentally means the Jew, the person from Judah. Uh, what, what does he get for betraying Christ? He gets, some, and they're not even gold. They're just silver. So he's, he's trying to get a few coins. And uh, some people, I, I don't know if I agree completely, but some people have looked at one of the older Batman movies. You remember the Penguin? You know, this character? And saying he's a Jewish stereotype too because he's his mannerism might be stereotypically Jewish and he's trying to get a few coins. We've had an expression in the United States, uh, it's not a polite expression, but it persists, to Jew him down. In other words, you want to sell me a watch and I don't want to pay 2,000 dinar, so I don't want to pay 1,000 dinar and if you come close to my price, I have Jewed you down. The implication being that the Jewish person, maybe they're not a big businessman, but they're going to get a few silver coins in the process. Um, interestingly, this cliche or this stereotype has reemerged repeatedly in American politics. Uh, a prominent American political figure named Andrew Young, who is African American, uh, and who was the United States' ambassador to the UN a few years ago, more than a few years ago, he thought the microphone was turned off and he was talking. Occasionally our politicians forget to turn the microphone off. And he made a number of comments about Jewish businessmen trying to take money from black people in the ghettos. And this created a huge uh, controversy. So, in any case, these, these are some of the, uh, the stereotypes uh, that persist. And, and I guess uh, now I'd like to sort of turn to a sort of more uh, theological part of this story. Uh, there's the sociological, but there's also the theological. Uh, in trying to define who is a Jew, what is a Jew, there are several possible answers. From the Jewish standpoint, if you are descended on your mother's side from Jews, you are a Jew. That is the traditional rabbinical definition. In Hitler's Germany, the definition was merely if you had any identifiable Jewish ancestry, you might be identified as a Jew, even if you converted to Christianity, even if you became a nun, it didn't matter you might still be considered a Jew. Um, the very complicated part for American theology, and perhaps it is true here too, I don't know, is that the Old and New Testaments were written basically entirely by Jews, mostly for Jews. And one measure of the relationship between Christianity in America and Judaism is to look at how Jewish any individual personality is shown to be. Let me use Mary for an example. Um, I have, uh, my own background is not Catholic, my own background is Protestant, but I uh, work a lot in Catholic communities. I study Jesuits and I've uh, just been in Rome last week actually uh, with some Jesuits, and I have seen many, many, many representations of the Virgin Mary, and many pieces of writing and prayers about the Virgin Mary. I have never seen a deliberate reference to the fact that the Virgin Mary is Jewish. Historically, in the art that existed in Western Europe three or four hundred years ago, you will see various indications of Mary's Jewishness in the art form. When, she, when her parents are married, when she's presented at the temple, there's a priest who's Jewish. But in story, 
as told in both Protestant and Catholic churches at this time of year during Christmas. Mary's Jewishness is completely washed away, and she may end up being very non-Jewish in all respects. So that is, that is one uh, uh, sort of indication of, of the separation uh, between those two religions, Christianity and Judaism. Um, another complicating factor uh, is Martin Luther. Now, in my country, probably 140 million people belong to some Protestant denomination. Uh, it's my understanding that Protestantism in, in Serbia is less than 2%, something like that. So it's very small, I know, here. But in my country, it's very dominant. Every president except one, John Kennedy, has been Protestant. So Protestantism in its various forms is very important in America. The beginning of Protestantism is the writing of, of Martin Luther, the German monk who broke with the Catholic Church. Luther's relationship to Jews is complicated. At first, when he first breaks with the Catholic Church, he is rather friendly to Jews. He learns Hebrew. And he hopes that the Jews will join the new religion he is founding. But they don't at all. They stay separate. And by the end of Martin Luther's career, he is writing really mean things about Jews, like burn the synagogues and burn their holy books. So the problem of hostility to Jews is not a strictly Catholic problem. It is a Protestant problem. But, and here I'm going to get a little bit complicated for a few minutes, there are at least three other points I would like to raise. And, and this is a very complicated story. I'm only touching on a few points. One, although there is this hostility on some level among some religious Americans towards Judaism, there's also a real attachment to the Old Testament story. For example, when the first Puritans came to New England from England in the 17th century, they gave their children not typically English names, but Hebrew names. Hezekiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Moses, and on and on, instead of George, and Edward, and William. Many early American Puritans saw themselves in some way as a continuation of the people of Israel, the children of Israel. That's one sort of curious love-hate thing. Secondly, some Americans, when they first encountered the native population, the Indian population, as it's sometimes called, tried to prove that these Indians were a lost tribe of Israel. So once again, this desire to make a connection with uh, a Jewish tradition. And then my third example is the Church of Latter-day Saints, which is often known as the Mormons, there are, there are Mormons, I, or missionaries here in Serbia. They're everywhere, including Antarctica, I think. Uh, their Holy Book of Mormon builds on a Jewish story and, and builds off of the Old Testament in some very significant ways and also attempts to make a link between the native peoples of North and Central America and the old Jewish communities of the Middle East. So on the one hand, unhappiness among some religious Christians in America with Jews because they killed Christ or because they are greedy or because they are ugly. On the other hand, a great appreciation for the literature and for the tradition. 
And finally, in modern American foreign policy, as it exists today under the leadership of George Bush the second, not so much George Bush one, George Bush two, there is a sizable group of people in the United States who believe that even though they are Christians, that they should support the state of Israel strongly, politically, militarily. And the reason for supporting it is not out of love of Judaism, but because their understanding of their religion is that the second coming of Jesus will happen when certain things happen in Israel. As, as predicted by prophets. So you have this very strange relationship between Israelis and some American Christians where the Israelis, they appreciate the support, but they wonder why. Why the support? It's very similar to something that happened in England in the 17th century during the reign of a man named Oliver Cromwell who was dictator of England in the middle of the 17th century. And he invited Jewish people who had been kicked out of England to come back and live in England. Not because he particularly liked Jewish people, but because his understanding of his Christianity was that when Jewish people again lived in every nation on earth, that certain prophecies would come true. I don't, perhaps that needs a translation? No. No, it's okay. Oh, okay. Resumeli ste priču danas, da postoji ta dvostranost ljubavi mržnje sveđu pojedinih religija i jevrejske religije. Naveo je profesor tri primjera, s neću njim zalaziti, tiče se Amerikanaca, pa njihovog dolazka u Ameriku, kako su oni u početku davali svoje deci, ne imena John i tako dalje, nego ne znam, Ezekija i tako dalje, jer su se smatrali nekim nastavkom jevrejske države i jevreja. Zatim toga da su čak indijance smatrali nekim izgubljenim plemenom koje je nekada davno trebalo da nastavi jevrejstvo. I konačno primjer iz engleske činjenice iz engleske, koga ja sam već izgledala, iz 17. veka, da, kada se izvrde podržava jevrejska religija. Promel je, kao što profesor kaže, koji je bio izuzetno surov, nekada se danas na veku je vlada u Engleskoj i sam pozvao zbog toga što je bio hrišćanin, jevreje da se vrate nas u religiju, mislim, pardon, u ovu zemlju. Iako su se oni pitali zbog čega, ne samo zbog toga što je on smatrao da je to kao potrebno i jako ih je voleo, već zato što je verovao, kao i mnogi drugi pripadnici ostalih religija, da kada jevreji budu živali u svakoj zemlji na svetu, onoga će se obistiniti broj na proručanstvu. Tako da kroz vekove vidi se veza između raznih religija i spisa, pogotovo spisa, jevreskih na koje se mnogi oslavljaju iz ovih jevreskih različnih. So, my last comment in this very brief overview, my two comments really, one, the Jewish identity and the Jewish community, if you want to call it that, in America is uh, in question in the future, but not because of anti-Semitism so much, overtly, but because of two other things, I think. One, and I'll try to illustrate this with a, with a joke that Jewish people sometimes tell. I know jokes don't translate very well, but I will try. Uh, two Jewish guys are on an island. They're shipwrecked alone on an island. And so they build three synagogues. Three. One for one guy. One for the other guy. And one that no Jew would ever go into because only bad Jews go there. Now, a Jew told me this story. The point is, in America at least, Jewish people disagree about many, many points of their Jewishness. For example, in the 1980s, 
Woody Allen. You know Woody Allen. He's Jewish. He's funny. He might be ugly. I don't know. Uh, he's not beautiful. Uh, he signed a letter in the New York Times criticizing Israel for its policy in Lebanon. And a Jewish rabbi said, I, I kick you out. You're no longer Jewish. And Woody Allen said, you can't do that. I kick you out. You know, I, and so it, it's not like being Catholic where you could be thrown out or being a, a Quaker or a Mennonite. Who, who decides? So one problem that Jews face in America is complete uh, disagreement about the whole nature of their identity. And that could, that could pose a problem long term. It is very interesting, but it's a problem. The other problem is much more basic. And it goes like this. Because Jews have succeeded in America, because they are accepted, largely, because they are integrated, they are marrying non-Jews. And they are having children that are not being raised Jewish. And the more educated a person is in the United States in general, Jewish or non-Jewish, the fewer children they often have. So that simply through assimilation and intermarriage, what may emerge is uh, two Jewish communities, say in 50 years. One small and clearly identifiable through appearance and maybe practice a larger, and I would call it Jewish shadow, of people who have some connection, who remember that their family was Jewish, who like Jewish foods at certain times of the year, but are married to an atheist, or a Catholic, or whatever, and their children have only the most uh, symbolic an abstract connection to Jewish culture. An example of this, briefly, is the Hanukkah Bush. Not President Bush. Hanukkah Bush. This is an American creation, I think. You have you, Christmas trees are a, a practice here now in import, along with Ronald McDonald and Santa Claus. Hanukkah was never a gift-giving holiday for Jews. It was a holiday about survival during wartime. When Jews moved to America, because Hanukkah occurs close to Christmas, it began to become a gift-giving season. But you, Christians have a tree. Well, the Jews have to have something, so some Jews invented the bush, a little tree. Well, this is this is nothing to do with Judaism. This is American commercialism repackaged for Jewish people. Uh, and so here's an example of uh, something that might be Jewish, but if you look, if you saw a Hanukkah bush, you wouldn't necessarily uh, connect it with anything historically Jewish. So that might be the shadow uh, Jewish situation. Uh, so I guess in closing, uh, what I would like to say is that uh, American Jews are in a complicated situation because, one, they do face assimilation and gradual absorption into the very powerful American consumer culture that tends to absorb almost everyone. Two, the political situation with Israel has created a dilemma for many Jews. Is it possible to criticize Israel and still be a good Jew? There's debate. Is it possible for a non-Jew to criticize Israel and not be anti-Semitic? Again, controversy. So American Jews, some of them are in a very difficult relationship to Israel at this point, although many of them are still very, very loyal. And then finally, how good is assimilation? American Jews, looking at history, might look at three or four other countries. For example, German Jews before 1933 were 
very assimilated into German society. Some of them reached very high positions, and yet things went very badly for them after 1933. So assimilation was no guarantee of happiness. In France, legal protection for, assimilate, for acceptance into the French society, and yet anti-Semitism persists in France, and some people would say it is increasing. And then the third example from the old Soviet Union, again, uh, no, after the death of Stalin, no overt persecution of Jews, but a sort of melting away of Jewish identity within that atheistic state. So uh, a, a sort of a mixed picture ahead. Uh, and let me, let me close by uh, just telling you about one piece of research from another time and place that I did, and the translation may, may be needed here. Some years ago, I got interested in the question of when did the first Jewish students come to European universities? Is that, do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, I thought it was, I was a young scholar, I thought this is a simple question. I go to the records, I open the records, and I simply record the numbers as I find them. Very simple way to do research. I was wrong. Because when I went to the records from the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, what I found was the real question was not when did the Jews first come to the university, but who decides who is a Jew? Some professors would see a student in class and write down that person's background and say so-and-so is Jewish. The same student in another class with another professor not identified as Jewish. And this raises fascinating questions. Did the students identify themselves? Did they cut off their beards and try to blend in? Did the professor who did not identify them fail to identify them because he was lazy? because he didn't care, or because he was trying to spare them persecution. So my research ended up not just with counting numbers, but with the entire question of who owns that identity. And in the United States, where I think every aspect of personal identity is under debate, social, political, sexual, I think a question of Jewish identity and the ownership of that identity will continue to be argued well into the coming century. And let, if you want to do a bit there. Profesor Ješka je mlad profesor, pomislio da je bilo odlično da je on istražuje kad su se to prvi put jevreji počeli upisivati na univerzitetu. Mislio je da će to biti dovoljno samo popisati godine i super, rezultati su tu međutim. Naišao je na brojne probleme, jer je vidio da po zapisima jedna osoba bi bila registrovana od strane jednog predavača kao jevrej, a onda od strane drugog nema te registracije. I onda je izniklo mnogo više pitanja nego na početku. Zašto se to desilo? Da li zato što se osoba o kojoj se radi obrijala, promenila izgled, pokušala da se asimilira bolje? Ili profesor koji je potrebivao koje šta? nije mogao da prepozna, bio lenj ili prosto možda je htio i da zaštiti tu osobu od antisemitizma. E tako, brojna pitanja, kao i ona reci, brojna pitanja su rečite u žarištu, tako je i to pitanje ko je zapravo jebe i ko može da odredi ko pripada jebeskoj sajnici. Well, I think now it is 13 hours and I think it's time for questions for a few minutes. That's what you get as a break. You get to ask questions. So please, you ask me and we'll see if we can have more of a conversation. Thank you for your attention. It's hard to sit and listen to a foreign language, I know. Please, any question? Please. Uh, I've read in a book from Edwin James, uh, Comparative Religion, that the Jewish people uh, see Jesus as a confused Jew. Yes, many do. Uh, there have been a number of uh, ways of dealing with Jesus ranging from quite polite to not very polite. Uh, early in the history of Christianity, some rabbis 
said that Jesus' father was actually a Roman soldier, and the whole thing was not what it seemed to be. Others have said he tried to be a prophet, but he was confused, he was deluded. Uh, many have simply found it better to ignore him. So there are many, uh, many responses, certainly. I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? No, no. Oh, is that the, that the, was the, the question. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And uh, if, you, if, if, if a rabbi were answering your question, he would probably use Jesus' Hebrew name, Yeshua, and he would talk about his mother, Miriam. So to begin with, there'd be a renaming. And, when you, and some Jewish people would say, when you call it Jesus, you're using the English form of the Latin form of the Greek form of a word that was actually Aramaic, and you're confused about who he actually was. That's what I think. So yes, there's a if you if you are coming from a classical Jewish perspective, you might see Christianity as stealing all of your holy books and adding on this kind of crazy book at the end, and it is you know it's confusing. Especially if you've been taught, and I haven't said anything about the Messiah, or the Messiah, that the Messiah is supposed to be a king on earth with an army, not this guy on the cross. So, yes, I think, short answer, da. Thank you. Good question. Yes, sir? I must say uh, that the language is not so good. So Better I, than I, my I, Serbian. I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. Uh, uh, you said that uh, the moods... Uh, about uh, funk Jews, like a stereotype. Yes. Uh, is a bad stereotype, yes? Mm, it's mixed, I think. I would yes. not say it's completely bad. Because uh, I found that uh, the funny Jew uh, is maybe a try uh, of a better assimilation in the United States. That, that's first. I'm interested what you think about that. Uh, and uh, second, about... Uh, what, uh, <coughs> Does uh, one Jew uh, the, do <laughs> can he uh, uh, criticize uh, Israel? Uh, I'm confused with that one yes, because yes. because uh, after the Second World War, uh, everyone lost something except Jews and except uh, United States uh, long term. Uh, Jews mm -hmm. get a state, mm -hmm. a United States states world domination. And uh, is uh, that, but uh, what they get uh, mm -hmm. some, somehow mixed up and uh, connected? Well, you have just asked a question that belongs on a doctoral examination, but I will try, and I will try. It's a very good question. Your first question is a little bit easier. Uh, yes, uh, I think, I think the, the, funny, the funny image is a way that many minority groups in the United States move to various levels of acceptance and interest. Um, I don't know, is Chris Rock a, a known personality in, in, in Serbia? Yes, yes. No, he's an African-American comedian. He's extremely outrageous, and he says the most amazing things with a big smile on his face. And I think he's a very good example of a tradition among African-Americans of being entertaining, but while you're being entertaining, making a real comment about the political situation and about your situation. And, and um, I was told this when I used to be a grade school teacher by a senior teacher, get your students to laugh, because if they're laughing, they'll forget that they're not supposed to be learning. In other words, once people begin to laugh, then maybe they will be open and they will learn something. So I would say, yes, uh, the, the, the Jewish entertainment tradition is perhaps different from the African American or the Latino or whatever, but yes, I think it's been a way of, of, of uh, uh, gaining acceptance and moving ahead. Um, to your second question, uh, it's hard to answer because I cannot speak for millions of American Jews who disagree with each other, but there's a range of reactions ranging from, yes, I can criticize Israel, and yes, I want to distance myself from Israel, and yes, I'm even very upset and angry about Israel, all the way over to another very hard-line position. 
And let me briefly, I know we have little time, illustrate the hardline position by a conversation that took place between Menachem Begin, who was Prime Minister of Israel in the 1980s, and Paul Tsongas, who was a Greek, uh, a, a, an American senator whose family originally came from Greece. All right? So Begin comes to, to Washington. And he meets Senator Tsongas. And Senator Tsongas says to him, Sir, I think we have some things in common because your people have experienced a, a massacre, a genocide, and my people as Greeks under the Turks also experienced a genocide. Begin's response was, Your comparison is invalid. Our problem is unique. Our situation is worse than yours. So he didn't even want to uh, make that connection. He, he, his understanding of Israel's uh, response to, to the Holocaust was, there are no comparisons. By no means would a majority of American Jews agree with that position. But I think it is fair to say that in America there is a point of view that the Holocaust should be viewed as a uniquely terrible event and therefore uh, one should treat the consequences of it such as the creation of Israel in a different way from how you treat other, uh, other situations politically. Uh, I don't think it's a majority opinion but I think it's, it's a widespread view. Does that help somewhat? In, it, it's very complicated, and it, if I had three rabbis in here, they might all disagree with one another and with me, but I think, I think that that point of view is, is, is in the mix. Other questions? Very, very hard, good questions. I wonder, Please. is there any hierarchy there, like you have in Catholic Church? I'm sure there isn't. But in America, how is it? Among, among American Jewish, Jews? Yeah, oh. Jewish communities, so... Uh, they work the, for themselves or? There are three major branches of, of Judaism practiced in America. Conservative, Orthodox, and Reformed. Um, there are no popes in charge of any of those. The Reformed is the least conspicuously Jewish. A, a Reformed service looks a lot like a Protestant Christian <laughs> service. Conservative is somewhere in the middle. Orthodox would be more hierarchical, more oriented towards authorities who are rabbis, uh, who are studying documents. And then within orthodoxy, clusters of very uh, isolated groups, including uh, Hasadim, Lubavitch, and a group called the Satmars. There are many others who really are uh, totally authoritarian, often with one leader who's who passes on his authority to his sons. And, but, but many Jews completely don't relate to that at all. To them, it's, it's like a monastery. It's just way over there. But, but no, there is no Jewish pope. Uh, and the great advantage has been that it's allowed the American Jewish communities to adapt. But the great disadvantage is uh, it doesn't present a united front in a crisis situation. So yes, that's true. And also, rabbis are not ordained. Rabbi merely means teacher. It's not like being a priest. There are no Jewish priests today in America. And that's an important thing that many Christian Americans don't understand. The rabbi is simply a teacher. He doesn't have special sacramental authority to, to say, you are forgiven or you are a bad person. He's a teacher, as was Jesus. But he has a different authority. He, he has an authority that comes from knowledge and from interaction with the original uh, materials. But to come back to my bad joke about the island, there's a saying, two rabbis, three opinions. Because they're constantly arguing about the meaning of texts, as are other groups, of course. But uh, when you deal with texts that are 2,000 years old, 3,000 years old, there's going to be great uh, disagreements sometimes about what words mean and and how to apply them and so on. But yet yeah, there's certainly authority, but it's, 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 it's uh, as I would say, as much intellectual authority as spiritual authority. Scholarly authority. Other questions? We've got a few more minutes and then we need to totally change topic here. Uh, could you say something about the messianic movement? 
today or long ago, or, or uh, you mean in America today, yeah. among Jews, uh, I would I would say there 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 are two types I am familiar with. Uh, one is uh, a very isolated uh, and intense group waiting and looking for the for the military and political messiah. And interestingly, many of those people do not support the state of Israel because they believe there should be no Israel until there is a Messiah. So they are very Jewish if, if to meet them, but not necessarily pro-Israeli. The other group, and there may be others I'm unaware of, but the other group that is of interest to me is the Jews for Jesus, who are culturally Jewish and retain many of those cultural characteristics, but have decided that Jesus is the Messiah. And their, their situation is sort of intermediary between traditional Judaism and Christianity. There are both Jews that reject them and Christians. That the, uh, Christians say, if you're going to go this far, why don't you come on over here? Um, and I might mention in passing, I didn't say anything about this, but you know, uh, Paul, St. Paul, of course, gives very elaborate arguments about why we need to leave if we're Christian, why we need to leave Judaism behind and become fully Christian. But he presents his arguments, for example, in the Epistle to the Romans, in a completely Jewish format. The argumentation for not being Jewish is completely Jewish. And I think that's an interesting issue in itself. That, more than that, I probably can't say right now with the time. Any other questions before we totally switch? Oops. Nothing. Oh. We'll take a big inhale and exhale because you've got 47 more minutes with me. Uh, so we'll go on to another topic because it's a double show here. Uh, totally different time, totally different place. Uh, I was asked if I would say a few words uh, about the Jesuits as a group. I don't know how, how have you all heard of the Jesuits? Jesuiti. Uh, Jesuiti, how do you say it? Jesuiti. Jesuit. Okay. Uh, let me say a little bit about my own background. Uh, my background is not Catholic, uh, but for the past 14 years, I've been working at St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri, USA which is a historically Jesuit institution. And for most of that time, I have been doing research on the largest, most powerful, and most controversial branch of the Catholic Church, the Society of Jesus, which is known generally as the Jesuit, the or Jesuits. And uh, I think perhaps it'd be best if I said some general things about them, and then if we can get maybe closer to the Greek Catholic part, but at least uh, probably the class hasn't had a lot of exposure to who the Jesuits are in general. I would, is that, would that be true? We didn't have any. No, nothing, okay. Uh, I don't know whether it's true in Serbian, but I know that in Ukrainsky, if you, if, to use the word Jesuit, Jesuit, it means that you're being tricky, you're being maybe even dishonest. The Jesuits worldwide have both an excellent reputation for scholarship, for missionary work, for intellectual achievement, but they are also widely mistrusted throughout the world. They were founded in the 16th century by St. Ignatius of Loyola, who was a soldier in the service of the King of Spain, he was not a particularly religious man. He liked to fight with swords. He liked women. He liked having some vino. <laughs> and he's in a battle in a place called Pamplona in the north of Spain. And he was hit by a cannonball, a small cannonball, but it's still a cannonball. It hit his leg. <laughs> Mm 
duže u španski vojsci, kako je razumem. I evo šta se desilo je jednog dana, kada je negdje na severu Španije, ga udrlo da potiko džuha. This was in the 16th century. Ignatius is in bed for a year. He's seriously hurt. As he recovers, he asks for someone to bring him something to read. He was hoping for a novel. They brought him a religious book, The Life of Christ. So he's in bed, he's got nothing to read except this book, it's a castle, he can't go anywhere, he undergoes a religious experience. His life completely changes. When he is well enough to walk again, he walks to a church, he takes his sword that he has fought with as a soldier, he puts it on the altar and he walks out and he goes on to found a new Catholic religious order. Is, is it okay? It's okay? Okay. There are a number of things about the Jesuits that are completely different from most other Catholic organizations. First of all, no women. Except one. There was one woman if you ever hear that there were no women Jesuits, you can say that Professor Shore said there was one woman Jesuit right at the beginning, but basically no women, so it's kind of macho in a way. Which is different because there are women Franciscans, women Dominicans, women Benedictines, and so on. No women in the Jesuits. Secondly, no monastery for the Jesuits. The Jesuits will not go and live and pray south of Novisad in the Garden Monastery, like some of the monasteries I drove past when I came here. They're going to work in the world, often in individual isolation, not in a group. Now, that might seem like that's going to lead to a lot of contradictions and confusion. So another thing that distinguishes the Jesuits is that the top Jesuits of the four ranks take an oath of personal obedience to the Pope. So yes, they live often alone or in small groups. They are not supervised. They are on their own initiative. But they have sworn obedience not just to their boss, but to the Pope in Rome. The Jesuits that I work with have all taken oaths to the Pope. I don't know. Is the translation? Yeah, it's, it's, okay. it's okay. It's different. It's not like other orders. Now, that, those are some different characteristics. So the Jesuits are organized. They go forward. And right away, there's something very distinctive about their project, their, their undertaking. They interact with the highest and the lowest levels of society. The first Jesuits among, who, who join are both associated with princes and kings, and they work with prostitutes and outcasts. The first school the Jesuits operated was for prostitutes to rehabilitate them, to give them another skill so they could do something else. So, down to the present, the Jesuits worldwide continue to have these associations both with the most disadvantaged and often with the most privileged. For example, the current president of Bolivia, Evo Morales, one of his closest confidants is a Jesuit. So they continue to have associations with, with often with very politically powerful people as well as working with the very poor. Now, some other things that are unusual about this organization and interesting, at least to me, they are the only 
large religious organization, and, and you would know more about orthodoxy than I, but I don't think this has happened in orthodox Christianity either, where they were completely outlawed and put out of business, and then they came back. So for 41 years, after the Jesuits were the biggest teaching organization anywhere in the world, from China, the Philippines, Cyprus, Transylvania, Voivodina too, Spain and on, they had this huge operation and then they made so many enemies, they were completely eliminated. And then after 41 years, they were reinstated. So they have this very complex relationship with authority. So here is this organization. To this day, they are still the largest religious order in the Catholic Church. They operate 17 colleges and universities in the United States alone, including Georgetown University, where Bill Clinton went to school. Uh, but they also have these uh, connections with the very, very poor. Now, coming in a little bit closer to uh, where we are here in Serbia, there's a project that the uh, Jesuits embarked on in the 17th and 18th centuries. And this is the part that perhaps uh, uh, your, your teacher has asked me to talk about. And that is the Greek Catholic Church. Is that a very active organization in this part of Serbia? The Greek? Yes. It is here. OK. The Greek Catholic Church, perhaps there are members in this room. I don't know. Is this possible? No? Maybe? The Greek Catholic Church was an attempt to connect Orthodox and Catholic. Many people don't know that this project was actually undertaken. For 300 years, the Catholic Church, after the separation of East and West, attempted to connect with the East. It didn't work very well. So eventually, Rome in the West came up with a short list of four things that the East had to agree to in order to join with the West. And I'll just mention these very quickly because they are still pieces of the story. One, the, anyone from the East who would join would have to recognize that the Pope <laughs> was their leader. Two, they had to acknowledge something that does not exist in Orthodox Christianity as far as I know. And I don't, know if this can even be translated, but purgatory. Is it, is it is a concept in, in the East, or at least it's a word? Uh, it's not limbo. Purgatory. It's a place where you go it's, if you're not... It's the waiting room. Yeah, yeah. We have the checkout, you sort of sit and wait. Okay. Yeah. Okay, don't. Yes. Uh, thirdly, in the, in, the, in the sacrament of the mass, the certain type of bread had to be used. And then fourthly, uh, a complicated piece of theology, the whole, this is uh, not of much interest to people today, but the Holy Spirit yeah. had came from the Father and the Son and not just from the Father. Okay, so what does this have to do with this region of the country? As you probably know, over 300 years ago, the Voivodina, was part of the Austrian Empire. I assume you get this in school, more or less. Okay, used to be the Ottomans. Then the Ottomans are defeated. They retreat down the Danube. And the Austrians come in and take over. So the Austrians arrive. And the Austrians are Catholics. Not just sort of Catholic, but really Catholic. In fact, the royal family in Vienna, the Habsburgs, see themselves as the shield of Catholicism, the guardian, the champion, the, the real force. So there's this real desire to spread Catholicism into these regions, including this region. And uh, the Jesuits set forth a program to make that con conversion possible. But there are a number of difficulties that I'll just touch on. 
Um, one, language. Um, a few months ago, I was working in an archive in Vienna. And do you say Beach for Vienna here? It's just like Hungarian. Let's say Vienna or something. Beach, okay. To Beach, or however you say. In Vienna, there is a record that Jesuits came to Belgrade and they attempted to preach to the people. They didn't know Serbian. They knew Czech. It's not so close. Not close enough, maybe. So, they speak Hungarian. They also know Czech, maybe Slovak, but it's not enough. So there's a language barrier. The, they, don't know, they don't know Serbian, they don't know Romanian. Secondly, and more important, there's a cultural difference about what it is to be a priest. The Jesuits are unmarried, university educated, Latin speaking priests, and their whole conception of what it is to be a priest is to be university educated, unmarried, and Latin speaking. How does that compare with an Orthodox priest? Because what is an Orthodox priest's characteristics? Married? Married? Not Got a beard, looks like a man. And, well, university educated. Maybe it's possible, but not required. That's not, <coughs> not obligatory. From what I can determine, many of the Jesuits, when they meet the priest that they want to get into union with, and they see his wife and his kids, and his pigs that he keeps back behind the house. You know what their reaction is? Not so good. On the other hand, here's a priest, Orthodox, in the village. His father was the priest. His grandfather was the priest. His priesthood is his profession in the way uh, that a shoemaker and everyone else in the village has a job. It's about having a family, it's about being a man, and it's about living in the village with the villagers and living their life. What do you think he thinks of the Latin-speaking, clean-shaven, black-robed, Austrian Jesuit? Who is this guy? Why? Where's his family? Uh, what does he know about real life? He's giving advice about trying to help people in his marriages, in their marriages. He doesn't even have a wife. So there's there's a very uh, significant cultural gap on the level of what it is to be a priest. On another level, uh, the Catholic Church, to whom the Jesuits, if they have taken the top step, have a vow they have taken. The Catholic Church is a hierarchy. <clears throat> pope, cardinals elect the Pope, then there are bishops and archbishops and, and abbots, and they supervise monsignors, and then there are priests. It's a pyramid. Rome is at the top. What is the structure of the Orthodox churches of the East? You tell me. This is your homeland. How is it constructed? By nation. By na national church? No. Okay. Often with national language yeah. being important in the liturgy. Uh, the uh, authority is not vested in one particular leader. And uh, the traditions that come out of that national church are extremely important yeah. and not easily altered under any circumstances. So the Jesuits come in, and, and here I'm speaking more about Romania. I don't know as much about the immediate Serbian situation. But in Romania, for example, they try to talk to these priests and get them to join up. And I think many of the priests don't even know or care what it is that they're joining up to be a part of. Uh, so there's sort of this mutual uh, potential disagreement between these two groups. But there is one place where the Jesuits do have some contact with local people, 
and that is another whole level of Jesuits who are not priests, who are called brothers. The brothers are not university educated. They don't have families. But they, they live much more like the other people in the community, and they are much more likely to speak those languages, and they may actually be a member of the local ethnic group. In, in my work, it's been interesting. There's tons written about Jesuit priests, almost nothing written about the brothers, although there are many, many brothers, probably because the Jesuit priests write about each other. They don't even think of, to write about the brothers. Um, so this is a place where there is some contact. Now, the Jesuits come into this region, this whole greater Danube region, at the end of the 17th century. But as I said a few minutes ago, the Jesuits are put out of business. In 1773, over 200 years ago, the Pope bans the Jesuits. They are put out of business, they lose their property, uh, they lose everything. That leaves the Greek Catholic Church without its biggest supporters. So now, a question arises, if you're trying to build the Greek Catholic Church or maintain it, where do you look for support? And again, I know much more about Romania, but there is great controversy in Romania as to who are the real Eastern Rite Christians, the Orthodox or the Greek Catholic. Both groups accusing the other group of not being authentic and Pravoslav, being true in some sort of way. So this situation continues. Uh, I don't want to say too much more because I think it would be better if we could have a few questions. There's a lot of very, very uh, technical things here, but uh, I think some of the questions that come up are, is it appropriate morally, ethically, for groups to come into a region and try and influence the local religious composition. And I know this is a current issue in Eastern Europe because of Jehovah's Witnesses and other groups that have come, in many cases from America, and have come to traditionally Eastern Orthodox countries such as Russia, uh, perhaps Serbia, certainly uh, places like Romania. And there's a whole question, can you have a pluralistic society and let anybody in to preach their own beliefs? And related to that, and I'd be interested to hear your views, should a country that is a democracy, like Serbia, have a national religion, or at least a religion that occupies a position of relative privilege in comparison to other religions. Does that, you think, you need a translation? Or is no. That clear? It's okay? America, the United States of America has made a very uh, complicated and ambiguous stand on this question. Officially, it says in our Constitution, there will be no established religion. <coughs> but, on our coins, on our money, it says, God we trust. Yes. Yes. And all of our uh, our congresses have chaplains <coughs> who are paid out of tax money. All of our military have representatives from religions as officers who are chaplains in the military, paid with tax money. 
and religious institutions such as churches in America and church schools are tax exempt, which is a huge issue in America because of the cost of land. So America has decided not to establish religion, but in doing so, it has said that it will legitimate almost any religion, including, and I don't know whether this is a, a familiar concept here, Scientology. Yeah, of course. Of course. Okay. Is it a religion? It's not for me to decide. The lawyers have decided it gets a tax break. So in America, a very big country, there are new religions created all the time. And legally, they could potentially have the same position. So to come back to Serbia or any other Eastern European country, on the one hand, if you have an official state religion, you, would, you exclude that possibility to a large extent. On the other hand, if you uh, do not establish a rule, you could create the religion of Professor Paul Shore very quickly uh, and uh, you know, create all sorts of financial advantages. So America, so far the system has worked, but in the case of the uh, Greco-Catholic Church, here is an instance of a church that was basically imported to an extent from the outside with an outside agenda. Uh, and I would guess that attitudes are rather, feelings are rather mixed about that. But I would put this back to you. Should a democracy have a formal relationship with any religion? No. Why not, do you think, if, if I may? Uh, well, in our country, we have, I don't know how to say it, science. How? We have a religious education from the first grade of primary school yes. until the last grade of the high school. Your professor has written about this, yes. yes. I've seen this. And I think it is not appropriate to uh, bring a child at that age and choose, because the parents choose, should the child go to, mm -hmm. to that religious education or not. And uh, I don't think uh, the religion should be in any connection to the state. Because they can influence laws and, uh, mm -hmm. for example, in Croatia, the uh, members of the Catholic Church are in parliament. Yes. And they have their, they have their say. Yes. Uh, it is, uh, some, uh, sometimes it's a conflict between, between tradition and some changes that have happened uh, uh, that contradict the traditional views. Like, sure. Uh, we should shoot and use condoms or the abortion or some abortion questions always, yes. which are irrational in a practical way. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it wouldn't be very good to connect the state and uh, religion. Uh, here I'm expressing my own impressions, but in the United States, among all people of all backgrounds, probably 60 to 70 percent of the adults believe that the biblical story of the creation of the world is literally true and the scientific version is not true. I know whether you knew this. Probably 70 percent of the adults. Of that group, probably half would be quite comfortable with some sort of relationship between their church and the state. So here you have a very pluralistic country with a very, very high level of attendance in university, but a very, very high level of value system that you have just described as irrational, but certainly not scientifically based. So a very complicated situation in my own country where officially we're not supposed to take a stand. Uh, a thing I think that, that makes the case in Eastern Europe a little different from in America, to use the Greek Catholic Church as an example, is uh, the fact that many of the churches of Eastern Europe have a strong tie to national identity. When I've been in Poland, whatever the, the political backgrounds of the individuals, I have found that most Polish people, when asked, will say, I'm Catholic. And some people think that you can't really be Polish and not be Catholic that the two sort of meld together. Uh, that creates a real complication 
when you have something like a Greco-Catholic church which looks to Rome but has the customs of the local church, some of the other people will say, you're not a good Romanian if you're part of this church. But one view would be to completely separate the two. Another approach is what you might call the Scandinavian approach. Freedom of religion. Any religion is legal. Church attendance is very low. But there is a state religion, Lutheranism, and Lutheran pastors get their salaries from the state, from tax money. You can go or not go to church if you want. It's like uh, you can uh, have running water in your house if you want or not, and it's provided by the, the government. Uh, so far, that's worked relatively well in Scandinavia, but when um, Jehovah's Witnesses arrive, there could be other complications. Yes? You, uh, you uh, can choose to go to the church or not, but you pay for it anyway. Yes, you do. And, and that is not right. I think that's not right. And here also, uh, I'm a sociologist, and yes. I will not be able probably to get a job in school, but a uh, religious, religious education yeah. teacher will have lots of, in an entire country, from the first grade of primary school until the last grade of high school, how many grades does he teach? Uh, how many students does he teach? All the way through, right? Yes. All the way through. And many, Radno Masto. Job. Yes. Jobs. job positions, many job positions for them, mm -hmm. paid by the people of this country, who are maybe not uh, uh, Has Christian this been put to a general vote in Serbia? Has this been referred back to the electorate, or uh, was this decided at a legislative level? Do uh, the, the people want this? Uh, nobody asked the people, but I think that uh, the politicians made a pact with the church to... You know, I don't know if they promote them perhaps. or something. I think it was uh, introduced that way. It is Adali Postoi, Razumesh. You can choose between the uh, civil education, which contains, I don't know, bon ton, some other things, but, uh, and between the religious education. Mm -hmm. But the religious education exists, and the children are sent to religious education without, uh, they are at a certain age, of, they're seven years old. You mm -hmm. can't decide that a seven-year-old seven child no, can't parents decide. decide. Parents can't decide. I'd be curious to in know, the in, the, in the religious education that's offered in this country, is the non-scientific story of creation and the creation of human beings part of that presentation, or is it more moral, ethical? Because it's a very big controversy in America. Uh, many people who call themselves uh, creationists, who believe the biblical version of the creation of the world, they say, this is our theory. Darwin had his theory for every minute, for every hour, that Darwin is taught, we want our time. If you spend an hour on Darwin, we want an hour on Genesis. So I'm wondering, is that part of the uh, multi-religious situation in the public schools here, too? Or, or, or is it more moral, ethical, and not so much presentation of... Uh, not right now, but in the future it can be. Probably. It could be. What, what I look at, setting aside what is right and wrong, or true or false, from an economic standpoint as an American, I am personally worried because there is the biblical version of creation, there is the Hindu version of creation, there is the Native American and Eskimo version of creation. You, you everyone gets an hour, and pretty soon I'm paying for 12 teachers, 11 of whom my son will never see because he'll be in that one track. So uh, pluralism, here, here's my expression for this presentation. Pluralism has its price, and the more pluralistic you are in terms of addressing uh, the concerns of various groups, the, the higher the tag of the price. Yes? Uh, I want to uh, make one step back. Yes, please. Uh, uh, you asked us, uh, do, uh, should or should not uh, the religion be connected to the state in democratic societies? Mm -hmm. Is it correct? Uh, 
but uh, why not to ask the question a uh, little bit uh, differently? Bit differently, yes. Uh, it's, uh, I found that uh, it's uh, more important uh, for that uh, question uh, if uh, one society is big enough uh, to uh, accept uh, other uh, religion, number of other religions. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, in the United States, we have how, how many? Uh, five or six hundred of millions of people. Yes. yes. And uh, Bruce Lee is an American. And, yes, uh, sure. Uh, United States uh, don't have that uh, kind of tradition uh, that uh, other Eastern. Uh, Absolutely, have. it's very fluid. And uh, uh, societies like ours, yes. that has, I don't know, seven or eight million uh, mm -hmm. people, uh, cannot uh, take take that. Uh, that uh, kind of influence because uh, it's uh, very, very uh, possible to uh, lose the national uh, tradition. And yes, the, yes. Uh, right now, I and, I, uh, the, and uh, where, where democracy come, comes in. Uh, in? In Austria, where I'm living right now, there's about 7 million people, so a little smaller than Serbia in terms of numbers. One million of them are Muslim. And 95% of those Muslims either move to Austria or are the children of people who move to Austria. So they are not like the Muslim populations in the Balkans that have been living for centuries in the region. So Austria is a democracy. It's the church schools, the Catholic church schools are paid for by the government, perhaps somewhat like here. But there is a growing tension because increasingly there are people who don't want any part of that, who are Muslim or are atheist, and the size of the country is a very big issue. So one model that you, if I understand what you're saying, you might be proposing, is that you need a minimum critical size of a population in order to manage this type of pluralism. I don't know what that number would be, but that seven I million... I need this translation here. Okay. Uh, that, that, uh, no. okay. Sure. Mora da postoji minimalna količina ljudi koja će znači ublažiti te uticaje od drugih religija. Znači da ne bi došlo do gubljenja tradicional, tradicionalne religije, mora postojati određena količina ljudi za koju on ne zna koja bi trebalo da bude, znači da ublači sve te uticaje, da ipak se zadrži znači neke nivo tradicionalne religije, da ne progutaju. Tako mislim da to. Okay. Uh, another complicating piece and I know there isn't much time left is America has many, many religious groups, but it is relatively easy to change your religious affiliation. I, I've known people that I went to university with who have already joined and left several churches. I mean, kind of like getting a car, maybe, you know? And the church that I belong to has its roots in England, but where I go to church, probably half the people in the church used to be Catholic, but are angry at the Catholic church and left and went to my church because it was more comfortable or it fit their values. So that uh, you, you don't have, oh, if you live in St. Louis, then you need to be this particular tradition. It's, it's very uh, fluid. It's very changing. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'm not sure. Some people would say it's a bad thing because it's superficial. Other people, freedom is a great value in the United States. It's very important. Some people would say the freedom to choose is an extremely a highly prized thing. Um, what, what I would propose if I were in dialogue with, for example, uh, an Orthodox priest. I know no one in this room is an Orthodox priest. I would be interested to know how do you have a national church in Serbia or Bulgaria or any other country if the religion you're part of deliberately doesn't want to talk about nations in its founding documents. There's no mention of specific nations in the New Testament, for example. In fact, there's some emphasis on not identifying nations. So how, how can you be a Hungarian church person or any of these groups if you're part of a religion that says there are no nations that are really important, we're all children of God? That's a question 
I would be interested to hear the reaction from uh, an Orthodox stop. And I'm sure there is an answer there. A any other, uh, we're, we're, we're getting to the end here. Is someone coming in at two? It's okay. A any other uh, questions? 